All right. This evening, we're going to finish our two-part series on uh, spiritual warfare. And uh, let's go ahead. Let's open up in prayer. Father, we, we thank you for an opportunity to come together, Lord, and to study your word. Lord, would you make it alive to us, Lord, and would you enlighten our understanding? And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When it comes to spiritual warfare, the one thing that we really need to understand is the battle belongs to the Lord. It's not ours. It belongs to the Lord. Let's look at uh, Zechariah chapter 3. And this is when Satan was standing before God and accusing Joshua the high priest. It says, Then the angel showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you. Satan, indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? And so when we take a look at spiritual warfare, it's not us, but it's the Lord. God is in command of every situation, and God is in control. There's nothing that catches him by surprise. There are no sneak attacks. There are no contingencies that he hasn't made plans for. God is in command and control of every aspect of our life. And there's nothing that the enemy can do. There's no accusation or anything that he can accuse us of. Because remember, he's the adversary. He's the accuser, the father of lies. And he is going to take and he is going to accuse us before the father. And whenever that happens, we have an, we have an intercessor there, the man Jesus Christ. And whatever happens, we remember that even Satan has to obey God's decrees. And... In knowing that, that God is in control of every aspect of spiritual warfare. The enemy will attack, and when he does, God will be there for us. Now, we are part of the army of God, and as the army of God, we have marching orders. And we can find these, what Jesus gave to his followers and his disciples in two different places in the New Testament. One is we find in uh, Mark chapter 16, and Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Jesus had made a similar statement whenever he sent his disciples out to do their ministry work. He said, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents, and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. That's Luke ten nineteen. And so when we look at this, we are a called and chosen army. And whenever we are in the authority of Jesus, whenever we are in we are in Christ's name, that's the power, not just adding in Jesus' name we pray, but you have authority in Jesus' name. What can we do? Well, for purpose of our study, we take a look. We can cast out demons. We can pick up serpents. Drink any deadly thing. It doesn't hurt us. We can trade upon serpents and scorpions. And we have authority over all the power of the enemy. And so as we look at this, we can see that there's not a lot when it comes to spiritual warfare that we cannot do in Jesus' name. Now, some people have taken a look at this portion of Scripture and have taken it too literally. Pick up serpents and drinking any deadly things? Well, there are people who think that that is a measure of their faith. But if we read in context, it's not talking about their faith. It's talking about the authority that they have. So whenever we see this, uh, we see these listed in, uh, in Jesus' command about serpents and scorpions and deadly poison... I believe the key to that is uh, is the last line there where it says, authority over all the power of the enemy. Uh, demons, serpents, deadly poison, scorpions. I believe all those are metaphors for uh, the uh, uh, for the, the workers of darkness, for, for Satan and his minions. And we have all power over the enemy. 
We have authority over the power of the enemy, as Jesus said. And if we have authority over his power, then you know what? He has no power over us unless we give it to him. And so whenever we're in spiritual warfare, whenever we're attacked by the enemy, we have to, we have to realize that uh, we have authority over his power. And we can tell him to leave, we can rebuke him, and he has to go. Now, one of the things that's important to us is the object of our faith. Paul would say to the Ephesians, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Now, we take a look at this. This is not in yourself. I'm not strong, but the Lord is. I don't have might, but Jesus has the might. Jesus is the object of our faith. He is the object of our strength, and he is the object of our might. In spiritual warfare, it's not how long you've been saved, whether you speak in tongues or prophesy, whether you have great faith, but it's about the object of your faith. It's about Jesus Christ. And if you, if you believe to the point that you trust Jesus in all things, including spiritual warfare, that there is nothing, there is nothing that can stand your way. No demon can torment you. Satan cannot accuse you. And you know what? You have power and authority over, over him to cast him out and to tell him to leave you alone. Because why? Because of the object of our faith. Jesus has already defeated Satan and so we don't have to worry. Now, Jesus has given us weapons in our warfare. And we can find that uh, this in the story when Jesus was tempted by the devil. He had been led into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And at the end of it, he had some final temptations. And Satan offered him many things. And here's, here was his reply to him on the, all three occasions. It says, And Jesus answered Satan and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. During the second temptation, Jesus would say to Satan, after he made an argument trying to twist Scripture, he would say, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And after the final temptation where Satan said, Hey, I'll give you all, all the kingdoms of the world if you'll just bow down and, and serve me. And Jesus said to Satan, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall not, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So we take a look. What is our weaponry? Well, it's the word of God. It is what is written. Now in Hebrews, we found, we found the scripture, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so whenever Satan comes against us, we need to use the word of God. It's strong and powerful whenever we use it to, whenever we, whenever we use it in our sanctification and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us, which is what the content of the scripture is. But you know what? When we look in the book of Revelation, Jesus is described as having a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And that sword is identified as the word of God. And then we find that Jesus defeats his enemies with the sword of his mouth. And you know what? The word is powerful. And so whenever Satan begins to tempt you and cause you to doubt, you use the word of God on him. I remember a lady shared one time where uh, she was struck with terror and uh, she knew it was an attack from the enemy. So she began to try to think of scripture to, uh, well, to drive the, to drive the tormentor away. And she said she couldn't even remember the correct scripture. So she just began to quote different scriptures. And you know what? It worked. The tension left. She began to laugh because she couldn't even think of the right scripture. So she just continued to quote them and she received, she received peace, peace of mind. Even, even what she thought was the wrong scriptures, it was the right one for that one because it gave her peace and it drove away the tormentor. And so the word of God is sharp, it's active, 
And you know what? It is, it is what we should use whenever we face the enemy. It's not based on what Pastor Ed said or what anybody else has said, but it's what the Word of God says. In this spiritual warfare, we have some advanced weaponry. And it is, it is an awesome thing. And we find it when Paul was talking about his thorn in the flesh. As he said, uh, the messenger of Satan who was sent to buffet him, to give him a hard time. And so what did he do? Well, like all good spiritual warfare, he prayed. He says, I implored the Lord three times that it, that it, the messenger of Satan, might leave me. And God answered him and said, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Paul says, Therefore, I, re- would, I will boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Even whenever we're weak, we're strong because God's grace is sufficient. You see, all trials are winnable. Paul won his trial. Most people look at that and say, well, Paul didn't win because the, he still had his thorn in the flesh. He still had the messenger of Satan. But you know what? There was a way of escape for him. Just as Paul would remind the church at Corinth that there's no temptation that's overtaken them except what's common to man, and that God makes a way of escape with every temptation. And so Paul's way of escape was to let the power of God flow through him. Yes, he still had whatever uh, whatever malady it was, whatever thorn in the flesh, whatever messenger of Satan was still there. But you know what? He would rest assured that Jesus was with him always, and that God's power, he would continue to minister no matter what Satan threw at him, no matter how bad this messenger of Satan tormented him. And it was because of this weakness of the flesh that Christ's power was dwelling in Paul. This Paul thought he, he, he had the tendency towards pride, and I guess we, we all know ourselves better than, than most people do. And because the weakness with, was with him, the physical weakness, the power of Christ shone through him. Now, in the battle, we're going to have some enemies. And you know what? Our enemies, our enemies will come down to, well, they come down to this scripture right here found in Ephesians that many of us are very familiar with. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians 6.12. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is that all of these that are pointed out, that are enumerated here, that are listed, all these refer to the spiritual, the rulers, the powers, the forces of darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, all of these refer to the spiritual. Your enemy is not the government. But our enemy, Satan, can influence the government. Your enemy is not your husband or wife, but it might be Satan's influence behind them. Our enemy is Satan and his and his minions and his horde. And so whenever we realize that, it should empower us that even though Satan may be using other people and institutions and organizations, our Supreme Court, our president, our vice president, uh, a political candidate, it does not worry. It does not matter because the power behind them, if they are in opposition to God, The power behind them and the force behind them are the forces of darkness. We may not feel like we can do anything against the Democrats or the Republicans, but you know what? We have all power over the enemy. Jesus has promised us that. Now, one other thing, in every every war, there are going to be some insurgents, people who cross over the line, who aren't the regular troops. And you know what? They are influenced by Satan himself as well. And we need to recognize these enemy insurgents. They are described in uh, 2 Corinthians as false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan himself 
uh, disguises himself as an angel of light. It's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their according to their deeds. Think about that. Satan descri- uh, disguises himself as an angel of light. And if Satan can do that, then why can't false teachers, false prophets, false pastors, false evangelists, why can't they, why can't they take and disguise themselves as servants of God? These false Christians. And so how do you determine? How do you determine if someone is, uh, if someone is an insurgent, is an enemy insurgent? Well, look at their works. Look at their life. Look at their words. And then make judgment based on those things. Does it line up with the word of God? Do they have a Christ-like attitude? Are their words, do they line up with Orthodox Christian belief and teaching? Is their life, you know, I've seen a lot, a lot of people who, who've all suddenly claimed to have a new dispensation for God because God decided that it was okay for them to divorce. I would say that their life is not lining up with the word of God if they say that. Look at their works. Are, is the empire that they're building, does it glorify them? Or does it glorify God? So to make the determination whether someone is a false Christian, we have to pay close attention to what it is they're doing and what it is they're saying. Now, one of the weapons that we have against uh, these insurgents is the spiritual gift of discerning of spirits. This is not the gift of discernment. And people often say, they often confuse those things. But you know what? The Holy Spirit has gifted certain individuals within the body of Christ to be gifted with the ability to discern spirits. Now, by this, I mean whether whether the spirit or the attitude or the thought behind something is of God, is of man, or is of the devil. You see, there's a spirit behind everything that happens in this world. And the Holy Spirit has given us a advanced radar system with a spiritual gift of discerning of spirits. And I think this is probably one of the most underutilized gifts of the Spirit. You know, when people often, you know, well, in the scripture, when it says that we should desire earnestly the best gifts, I believe one of the best gifts that we could have in the church setting would be discerning of spirits to see, to see who's true and to see who's false. And so that, you know, it would be the shortcut, it would be the shortcut to watching their life's work and their um, words and what it is they've done. It may take a while for someone to show the true colors, but you know what? The Holy Spirit will always tell you, will always tell you the true from the false. Now, these false apostles and teachers, they've been predicted and they've been around from from the beginning. Uh, Paul would remind Timothy, he would say, but the Spirit explicitly, explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by, uh, by means of the hypocrisy of liars, searing, seared in their own conscience as with the branding iron. And so when we take a look at this, there will be false teachers. There will be people who are uh, paying attention to uh, deceitful spirits and doctrines of demon and hypocrisy. And you know what? What we have to do in that is we have to look at God's word. You know, that is where that knowing God's word is, like I said, is so important because, you know, many people will say, well, God's doing a new thing or we got a new revelation. Well, Everything that somebody says and teaches should line up with what the Bible says and teaches. If it's departing from, from what, from what the scripture says or it's going further than what the scripture says, well, then these are false apostles and false teachers. And it says that we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be on the lookout for them. We're supposed to watch. And you know, there are some more combatants in spiritual warfare. And unfortunately, uh, these are kind of close to home. James would tell us, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Military term right there. 
Is it, is it not the source of your pleasure that wages war in your members? And so James answers this question with a question. Isn't it your, yourself? Isn't what you desire? Isn't that what wages war among yourself and among your other believers? Now, in the next couple of verses, James in, uh, lists uh, some uh, lists some sins that Satan uses to sow discord in the body of Christ. And you know what? When he speaks about this, he talks about lust. And lust is more than just sexual sins. Lust is wanting something that is not lawful for you to have. James talks about murder, which we know is another euphemism for hating your brother. Talks about being envious. Talks about fights and quarrel within the body of Christ. Talks about prayer with wrong motives. And all these things, whenever we run after what the world wants, whenever we allow ourselves to be, act worldly and become worldly, we have become a friend to the world. And friendship with the world, well, James would put it this way, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so if you are, if you are being ruled over by these passions and these sins, then you've switched teams. If your prayers are self-centered, the enemy is using you, using the lust, the desire you have for something that you can't have or that you don't have. And he is making you an enemy of God, a combatant against God. And so the battle lines are drawn. There's a battle. And it's gonna, it, it's gonna, it's gonna come down to us doing something. That something is submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You see, this is part of spiritual warfare. Number one, and this is the important part, submit yourself to God. A lot of people jump down to number two, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. No, you can't resist the devil without submitting yourself to God. What does that mean? Well, the word submit is a military term, which means to obey those in the proper chain, uh, chain of authority. And there is no higher authority than God, and his word is his express will. And so whenever we take and we have our life line up with God's will, then we are in submission to his authority. Whenever we allow our, whenever we do what the Holy Spirit inside of us is telling us to do, we are submitting to God's authority. Whenever you obey what the minister of the Lord says, then you're submitting to God's authority. And whenever you submit an area of your life, Satan has to take his hands off of it. We resist the devil and he runs from us. And the more areas of our life, and I believe that it is progressive sanctification, that it takes a while for us to bring all the areas of our life under control of God, to submit it to God. And as we submit to these, we are able to resist the devil and he has to run away. And in bringing our life into line with what God's word, God's message, and God's messenger has to say, then we draw near to God. He comes near to us. And in this process, we become cleaned. God purifies our heart and our mind isn't divided anymore, but it's on the things of God. You see, a lot of, a lot of the spiritual warfare is not about binding Satan and casting him out, but it's about submitting yourself to God and having your mind stayed on Christ. You see, if we're going to be double-minded, that means one mind in the world and one mind in the spirit, then Satan is going to continually harass us. The battlefield is truly in our mind. And now we have some battle plans for our spiritual warfare. And the first one is, I think is very important, is we need to operate within grace. Paul would say to the Ephesians, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. You see, a lot of people, a lot of people allow themselves to fall under condemnation whenever they, 
whenever well, whenever they lose their temper, whenever they get angry. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, if you were a Christian, you wouldn't get mad about that. Well, no. Anger is actually morally neutral. It is neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it. You know, if you allow your anger to propel you into doing action, then it's a good thing. Well, provided the action is, a go- is godly action. But if we allow the anger to seethe in us, notice he says, don't let the sun go down in your wrath. How many of you have ever left a tea bag in a pitcher of tea overnight? A lot of us have. What does it do? It makes the tea bitter. Nobody wants to drink it after that. Well, anger does the same thing. If we allow it to seep or to steep too long, then it causes bitterness within us. And a bitter, and a bitter root will take over and unforgiveness will rule in our, it will rule in our life. And so we need to realize that it's okay to be angry. We need to operate under God's grace. God has given us the grace to be angry about about things. We can be angry with our husbands and wives. We can be ang- angry with the devil. We can be angry at the school system. But you know what? you got to do something good with that anger. Let it propel you to make changes in your life. Remember, anger occurs within you. And you're the master of your anger or your anger will be the master of you. And if we let our anger master us, then Satan has can have control of us. He can turn us according to his will. And so we want to make sure that by allowing our anger to move us in a positive direction, to make positive changes in our life, to set rules, boundaries, and limitations, then we're going to remove opportunity for Satan to attack us in that area. You know, once we operate in forgiveness, once we operate in uh, self-control, when we allow the fruit of the Spirit in our life, then Satan cannot or is not as likely to attack us in an area that we're strong. Another part of our battle plan should be preemptive strikes against the enemy. You see, we're going to cut off his plans before they can ever get started. We're going to destroy his command and control uh, center. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is uh, writing about a, is writing to the church about the uh, punishment that they've inflicted on a young man who, uh, who sinned, who uh, actually had his father's wife uh, as a, uh, as, as his wife. And so they put him out of the church. And Paul was writing about restoring him in uh, 2 Corinthians. It says, But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So our preemptive strike is to forgive. You see, Paul tells us here that Satan's schemes are rooted in unforgiveness. God would say, Jesus would say that uh, if we don't forgive men, they're trespasses against us, then our Heavenly Father will not forgive our trespasses against Him. Satan's schemes are rooted in unforgiveness. And you know what? To for, you know, once again, to, to forgive, that's, that is truly divine. And you know, it is an act of the Spirit in us. But you know what? If you will learn to forgive on the small things, then you know what? Forgiveness disrupts the plans of the enemy. If you're going to harbor unforgiveness, well, then Satan's going to make sure that he is he attacks you in that area of unforgiveness. So you need to begin to learn to forgive. Forgiveness is on your side, not on the side of the other person. I can forgive somebody whether or not they receive it or they accept it, then that is entirely up to them. But I have done my part. My spiritual warfare is to forgive as I have been forgiven. And then let the Holy Spirit do the rest. But that Satan does not have an area to attack if I forgive you. If you don't forgive me, well then guess what? Satan has an area to attack you. Now, one of the things about an enemy's attack is you know what? He will attack. You have to expect it. Some people say because you're a Christian, you're supposed to have a great life and no problems. 
but the enemy will attack you. Peter would tell us, be of a sober spirit, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So Satan's going to attack? We need to counterattack. We need to prepare for these attacks. And number one in being prepared for attack is to expect the enemy to attack. He'll attack your marriage. He'll attack your kids. He'll attack your thought life. He'll attack you in many different areas. And you know what? Expect him to attack. Now, when the enemy attacks us, we just don't throw up our hands and say, oh, me. But we resist. We don't give in to the temptation. We don't allow our anger to master us. We don't, we don't sin. And we do that by being firm in our faith. Remember, our faith is rooted in Jesus Christ. Not our faith in ourself. You know, my ability to resist temptation is not really all that great. But my ability to resist temptation through the power of Jesus, well, that is, that is without limit. And so I want to be firm in my faith, my faith in Jesus Christ, that he is going to see me through and that my belief is in his ability and my ability through him, not my ability in myself. And one of the things about knowing that the enemy is going to attack and that he has attacked, as, as uh, Peter would say, the same experience of suffering are being shared by others. We are all being attacked. Everyone who is a Christian is going to be, is going to suffer. But you know what? You need to use that suffering positively. Whenever you have a triumph over the, over Satan in a particular area of your life, you need to share that. And you know what? It's a good idea if you find someone else who is struggling in an area that you have, that you have got the victory in, and you can help that person achieve the same victory that Jesus helped you, helped you achieve. You see, as iron sharpens iron, so does the counsel of one man or one friend to another. And so we are supposed to help each other. We're supposed to sharpen one another. We're supposed to come alongside and encourage one another. And that's part of spiritual warfare. This next section kind of caught me by, uh, kind of caught me by surprise as I was doing my research. I've called this a good commanding officer. You see, a commanding officer, well, I always thought about the uh, officers. I thought, well, we submit ourselves to Christ. But you know, there are, Christ has ordained authority. And part of good spiritual warfare is good leaders. Paul would tell Timothy, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness uh, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they may come to that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. And so, a good commanding officer is supposed to train the troops. And you know what? One of the best ways to train is to be a good example. Paul says they're supposed to be kind. Not just kind sometimes, but it's just be kind to all. You see, people will imitate what you do, Pastor. It says to be patient. And well, that's that's hard too. That's hard sometimes, but you know, it is one of the things that the one of the gifts are the fruit of the spirit. And that as we submit ourselves to God, then the patience that we need will come about. It says that we need to even be patient whenever we are wronged. You know, that's hard. Especially if you've been wrong. It's like, wow, I what do I need to be patient with this guy for? But no, to be a good commanding officer, we need to be patient when wrong. And part of being that good commanding officer is teaching, like what we're doing this evening, so that you recognize the attacks of the enemy, so that you know what's coming up, and so that you know how to counter them. Good teaching. 
And then there comes to something which well, not very many Christians like and not many pastors like to do. But, you know, it's part of good spiritual warfare. It's correcting error. And you know what? If it is done in love, if it is done the way that it's supposed to be, then, pastor, you're going to help that person escape the snare of the devil. See, there are people who are in Satan's clutches, in his trap, and they need somebody to explain to them and to show them what's going on. And you know, the thing about it is if the person who is ensnared by the devil, he is actually a captive who has been turned. Paul says that he is held captive by Satan and that he does Satan's will. So pastor, part of, part of good spiritual warfare is to be a good teacher, a good corrector, to be kind and patient, and to help free those POWs who Satan has bound. Oh, it's not easy. Spiritual warfare never is. But you see, they're bound by the kingdom of darkness. And what teaching on spiritual gifts would, wouldn't be complete without uh, really what many consider to be the Magna Carta of spiritual warfare. That's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist the devil, to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayers and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petitions for all the saints. Now, we're not going to expound upon this this evening. I know some of you will be disappointed. But in proper context of Ephesians... There are two other things that we have to do before we can stand firm against the enemy. And so for the next three or four weeks, we're going to be looking at Ephesians with the eye of on spiritual warfare at the end. Now, the three things that Paul tells the Ephesians are, number one, we have to sit. We have to identify who we are in Christ. And once we have learned to sit well, then we have to walk. That talks about our daily, our daily life, how we apply the scripture and how we walk as a Christian should. And you know what? When we've done that, then we're ready to stand against the enemy. We'll be using the book by Watchman Nee for the next couple of weeks in his book entitled Sit, Walk, and Stand. I hope you'll join us next week for our new series that dovetails rather nicely with our, with our series on spiritual warfare. God bless you, and I hope you have a great evening.